Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the CLSA webinar series for today. Um, the way our uh, webinar will work today is that um, I will introduce our speaker for today, who will then continue with her presentation for about 40 minutes. Um, after that point in time, you can uh, type questions or comments in the chat box, um, and then I will moderate those questions and present them to the speaker to provide answers to you. Uh, you are welcome to enter questions uh, as the presentation is ongoing, but we will hold uh, those questions to post them to the speaker till the end of the seminar. Um, you can see right now there are some instructions uh, for the first time WebEx user, and hopefully you had some time to review those before we got started. Um, and it is my uh, pleasure to introduce to you today our speaker, Katerina Maximova. Um, Katerina received training in chronic diseases uh, epidemiology at McGill University and has been involved in the primary prevention of chronic disease through research on improving key modifiable behaviors um, such as physical activity, healthy eating, smoking, and obesity. She has expertise in using longitudinal approaches to understand the development of behavioral and biological risk factors during childhood and adolescence from chronic disease outcomes. Um, Katerina holds a new investigator award in prevention research from the Canadian Cancer Society Research Institute for her research program that aims to support the implementation of effective programs and policies to promote healthy behavioral changes amongst Canadians. Uh, since 2010, she has collaborated with the Non-Communicable non Disease Division of the World Health Organization Regional Office for Europe to consult on country capacity for chronic disease prevention. So um, through this seminar, uh, Katrina uh, will provide us some highlights how we can prevent chronic diseases through lifestyle modifications, which will also be important for the CLSA. Uh, as you know, the CLSA holds a longitudinal data um, relevant to the aging population that can be used in, in different manners as well. So, um, and I think I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ina Woben. I'm the Managing Director of the CLSA. And uh, with that, I'm going to give the floor to Katrina to continue um, this uh, webinar and give us her a summary of her research. Katerina, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Ine, <clears throat> for the introductions. Um, I hope you can hear me well. We haven't pre-tested the mic. Um, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to um, give a talk about chronic disease prevention and lifestyle modification highlighting some of the research that I was involved in for the last 10 years and my colleagues' research and just generally talk about issues that get me up uh, in the morning and that I'm passionate about. So <clears throat> let's get started. Um, in the last century, historically, uh, the leading causes of death were infectious diseases, um, tuberculosis, pneumonia, diarrhea, arthritis, and in the 19th century, and even more so in the last decades, um, chronic diseases, or on the international scene, we call them non-communicable diseases, or NCD, yeah, you will hear me uh, use the abbreviation uh, during the talk, uh, have emerged as um, the leading causes of death, disease, and disability in Canada uh, and globally. In Canada, chronic diseases, or NCDs, account for 86% of all deaths. Um, they put an increasing strain on health systems, economic development, and the well-being of large parts of the population, and in particular, people over 50 years of age, as we'll talk in, in a few seconds. Um, Cardiovascular diseases, cancer, chronic respiratory disease, uh, and diabetes are considered the four key or four main NCDs. Um, these NCDs are said to have high impact on health and human development and account for the vast majority of the chronic disease burden. Uh, 
At the global level, um, the United Nations political declarations in 2011 and in 2014 uh, on non-communicable diseases really put NCDs into the spotlight at the, on the global uh, level as a growing and substantive threat to sustainable human and economic development. Um, the image that you see on this slide is the Global Action Plan for the Prevention and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases that the World Health Organization developed uh, in response to these uh, UN political declarations. And the plan emphasizes the implementation of high-impact, cost-effective, and feasible interventions for the prevention and control of NCDs, um, referred to, you may have heard, as best buys or uh, good buys if they don't meet all of the requirements to be the, the best buy. So if we look at um, the number of deaths in, in Canada, uh, we see that cancers uh, in 2008 actually became the leading uh, overall cause of death in Canada, accounting for about 30% of death, uh, followed by circulatory diseases, which account for about 29 or roughly another third, uh, respiratory diseases. Um, however, just looking at the number of deaths, can while it, it can be informative, um, it, the number of deaths just gives equal weight to a death at age 90 versus age 25 or age 5, um, and does not uh, emphasize deaths that occur prematurely. If we look at um, a measure called potential years of life lost, which assigns additional weight to deaths that occur at younger ages, um, we see a slightly different pattern. We see that cancers now account for more than double um, of premature deaths, so roughly 1,500 years per 100,000 population versus 7, 755 years for circulatory diseases if we average uh, men and women. We also see large gaps um, huge gender disparities, in fact, uh, for circulatory diseases um, and not so much for cancers. To monitor countries' uh, progress on uh, towards chronic disease prevention, the Global Action Plan set out uh, a, a number of targets, or nine uh, global NCD targets that countries uh, are aiming to achieve by 2025. Uh, what's interesting here is that target number one uh, is a 25% relative reduction in risk of premature mortality from the four main NCDs uh, that I mentioned to you, cardiovascular diseases, cancer, diabetes, and chronic respiratory diseases. Uh, it's referred to as 25 by 25 target and has been adopted or committed by uh, WHO member states globally as the overarching target. Um, the other targets that refer to uh, reductions in behavior such as alcohol, physical activity, salt and sodium steak, tobacco, um, halting the rise in diabetes and obesity, uh, they are considered voluntary targets, <clears throat> unlike this first uh, overarching target. So we know, based on our current understanding, that about 70% of chronic diseases are preventable through behavior modification. Of course, this figure varies depending on which uh, disease we're looking at, whether it's cardiovascular cancer and which particular cancers are we are looking at. But generally, uh, it's believed that adopting the behaviors of a healthy lifestyle can prevent an estimated 70% of chronic disease cases. Of the key behavioral risk factors, and these are the ones that are targeted in the Global Action Plan, are tobacco control, harmful use of alcohol, 
unhealthy diet, physical activity, and obesity. Um, I don't think today I have time to talk about all of them, but I try to incorporate results on, on or touch on, on all of these, uh, perhaps except for alcohol. Um, I will talk most about obesity because this is where I've done most of my work. Um, and obesity is considered a major concern in the quest for uh, to prevent chronic diseases, including cancer. If we look at the recent 10 cancer prevention recommendations, uh, we see a lot of behavioral type recommendations. So most of these factors that I identified today for cancer prevention relate to lifestyle. This is an infographic, but let's look at them more closely. These are top seven. Um, the first one relates to obesity prevention. Staying as lean as possible with, without becoming underweight uh, is number one um, recommendation. And it's considered one of the most important ways to protect against, against cancer and a number of other common chronic diseases. Other ones relate to being physically active for at least 30 minutes a day, avoiding sugary drinks, limiting con consumption of energy-dense foods, eating more variety of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and legumes such as beans, limiting consumption of red meats and avoiding processed meats, limiting al alcohol consumption, and limiting consumption of salt food and food processed with salt. So if we turn to obesity as being the number one key recommendation, even though the link between obesity and cancer has emerged fairly recently, uh, the evidence on the link between obesity and cardiovascular disease, um, diabetes is, is more established. This is a fairly recent uh, risk factor identified for cancer, and still there is a lot of ongoing research. Uh, we know that overweight and obesity are now generally much more common than they were um, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, obesity more than doubled since 1990, and it continues uh, to increase. The graph shows increases since 2000, and even though we see that the rates are stabilizing across the country, uh, they're still continuing to climb. In terms of other risk factors, perhaps the greatest success in chronic disease prevention uh, in Canada has occurred uh, with regard to reducing the use of tobacco. Smoking among Canadians has declined by more than one half over the last um, one third of a century. Uh, for example, in 1965, 50% of Canadians aged 15 years and over were smokers compared with 21% in 2002. And this reduction brought important um, reductions in lung cancer, um, but nonetheless, the prevalence can, uh, is at 20%, so there is still some work to be done, and there are particular segments of the population that bear a higher burden uh, of, of smoking use. Um, with regard to uh, physical activity and healthy eating, um, the evidence is pretty sad. We see that 15% of Canadian adults meet physical activity recommendation uh, of being physically active for 30 minutes per day or uh, for at least five days a week, so roughly 150 minutes per week on a weekly basis. Um, and physical activity levels decline with age and are lowest among adults 60 years and over. With regard to healthy eating, uh, more than 60% of Canadians 
consume less than the recommended daily amount um, of uh, fruit and veg uh, and vegetables. Uh, in 2014, uh, this is the graph that I have on the right, uh, about 44% of females in each age group reported that they ate fruit and vegetables five or more times daily. Uh, it's interesting that the rate was higher for females than males in each uh, age group uh, consistently. Now let's talk more uh, about obesity. As I said, this is where a lot of uh, the work that I have done in the last uh, 10 years. And talk about obesity prevention and weight management, as we call it. So with regard to uh, obesity prevention, we talk about prevention of weight gain, uh, primary prevention, and uh, weight loss. Um, promoting weight loss as a, in, in those who are already overweight and obese, uh, so secondary prevention. An important aspect, however, of uh, obesity prevention is preventing weight regain. That's the dotted line. Why am I highlighting this? Because systematic reviews and meta-analysis of obesity prevention interventions consistently show uh, that um, modest improvements in physical activity and diet do occur. Uh, these improvements in clinical populations are significant and clinically meaningful, but these improvements are often transient and are not sustained in the long term. The key to effectiveness and sustainability of behavioral modification is long-term adherence to the physical activity and healthy eating regimen. Because sustained um, physical activity and healthy eating levels are needed for continued benefit. But most individuals relapse from adherence and uh, it remains a challenge. And this, is, this graph is from a study um, published in 2007 based on 2000, uh, sorry, 200 overweight adults uh, that were assigned to either standard behavioral treatment with, um, with an exercise goal of 1,000 kilocalories per week or um, high levels of physical, physical activity with um, 25 kilocalories as a goal. And we see that it resembles the graph that I just showed you. After, while well, the levels declined initially during the six months of the intervention, they crept up and at 30 months, there were no difference uh, uh, from the baseline. So the weight loss maintenance interventions was small in the short term and diminished even further over time. What is it that we need for successful weight loss? The National Weight Control Registry wanted to know precisely that. They followed individuals who succeeded at long-term weight loss maintenance. Uh, to be eligible for this study, uh, they, the individuals must have maintained weight loss of at least 30 pounds for at least one year. They followed 6,000 people, and on average, these individuals maintained weight loss of 70 pounds, uh, of at least 70 pounds for, uh, over, for about six years. And among the primary strategies for over 90% of these adults were a high level of physical activity and consistent self-monitoring of weight, diet, and physical activity. This meta-analysis of 64 obesity prevention interventions in children found that one factor that was consistently associated with larger intervention effects was uh, the recruitment method. Uh, such that children who self-selected or volunteered to receive an intervention uh, were um, exhibited better response than children who were assigned to receive an intervention. This suggests to me that adults uh, or children uh, who successfully maintained weight loss over long term were my, highly motivated to do so. Um, so I became interested in this topic uh, of motivation and um, how it affects uh, weight loss. Uh, 
the issue of recognition of overweight on the part of individuals, whether it's an important component of intervention strategies that are targeting behavior modification, such as increased physical activity and weight loss. This hypothesis is premised on theoretical models of behavior change that I have listed here. And while these theories have different theoretical underpinnings on how behavior change occurs, what's important, and each of them emphasizes that individuals must perceive that they or recognize that they are at risk in order to change their lifestyle behaviors. Unfortunately, the evidence in the last 10 years that's emerging um, shows that um, individuals do not perceive, significant proportions of individuals do not perceive, perceive their uh, overweight status. And the discrepancy is more common among overweight and obese um, children and, and adults. So this, this table shows that among overweight adults, 43% of men and 18% of women perceive themselves to be healthy weight or underweight. Uh, this is another example uh, showing that only 40% of overweight men reported being overweight, meaning that 60% of them thought they were normal weight. I became interested in this topic, and there was a study that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2007 um, using data from the Framingham, Framingham cohort um, study. Show, and it, it showed that having a social network with a high prevalence of overweight uh, was associated with weight gain among adults. Uh, these, these researchers assess the nature and extent of person-to-person -person spread of obesity as a possible factor contributing to the obesity uh, epidemic. And they found that a person's chances of becoming obese increased by 57% if he or she had a friend who became obese uh, among pairs of adult siblings. Uh, if one sibling became obese, the chance that the other would become obese increased by 40%. If the spouse became obese, the likelihood that the other spouse would become obese increased by 37%. Um, so then in 2008, we published a study using um, a representative sample of Quebec uh, children and, and youth uh, showing that um, parent body mass index and schoolmate uh, body mass index, so it was the average BMI of children uh, in the school, uh, made a, a difference for um, were important, such that what the heavier the parents or the peers, uh, the more likely youth were to misperceive, to underestimate rather um, their weight. <clears throat> the studies point that the environment is important, but also motivation uh, in obesity prevention is important. And the clinical practice guidelines um, that were revised in 2015 um, now uh, recommend assessing readiness to and barriers to change prior to implementing healthy lifestyle plan for weight control or or management. Now, while previous studies hypothesized that acknowledging excess weight may motivate action and change, very few studies actually investigated if weight status misperception is related to lifestyle behaviors that people uh, engage in, such as physical activity or healthy eating or other lifestyle behaviors. Uh, this study um, uh, was using data from uh, NHANES in the United States uh, based on um, a stratified multi-stage probability sample, uh, large 10,000 people, um, and um, they ask if people consider themselves to be overweight, underweight, or about the right weight uh, using measured BMI to uh, juxtapose uh, these perception. And they found that weight misperception was associated with less interest in or attempts at weight loss and less physical activity. The results for um, uh, energy for dietary intake were uh, less less consistent. Um, so where did we take this research next? Um, I worked with the Pediatric Weight Management Clinic in Edmonton to look at 
the degree of readiness to improve nutrition and physical activity habits. Uh, and we looked at um, medical records of 113 children who were enrolled in this outpatient weight management clinic. Um, parents completed the weight loss behavior um, stage of change scale that you see on the right uh, to assess their degree of engagement in making healthy changes to their lifestyle behaviors, such as uh, increasing dietary portion control, food and vegetable intake, physical activity, planned exercise, and et cetera, and the responses were linked to the trans theoretical model of behavior change. Um, then we uh, looked at these responses and juxtaposed them, uh, linked them with uh, the actual uh, behaviors of these parents. Now, these are the parents of children who are already, uh, who were referred and were enrolled in weight management. What was surprising to us is that we found two-thirds, uh, before we look at the results in the table, look at the sample size of uh, the N equals 43 and N equals 70 of parents who were more ready versus less ready to make these behavioral um, type modifications. What we see is two-thirds of parents presenting for obesity management with their children were in lower stages of readiness, pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation. Um, uh, but the more ready group, uh, we did we do see some differences. Those who are in higher stages of readiness, uh, i.e. action or maintenance, uh, they have more positive lifestyle habits related to portion sizes, dietary fat consumption, fruit and vegetable consumption, physical activity, and were more likely to meet the daily recommendations uh, for um, fruit and veg and physical activity, which is what you see uh, in this table. <clears throat> As a next step, uh, we um, wanted to continue this research uh, and uh, in motivation, and we applied to CHR and received a grant to develop and assess a brief web-based uh, intervention that was designed to motivate parents uh, to prevent uh, childhood obesity through primary care uh, setting. Uh, we engaged parents when they were waiting for a pediatrician appointment uh, in a primary care clinic waiting room. Uh, they used iPads to uh, fill out the questionnaires and, and respond to the intervention. So this was a double-blinded parallel designed randomized control trial, um, and parents were block randomized into one of the four brief interventions. So what was the intervention? The intervention uh, was parents responded to a question about their uh, healthy, about their, sorry, their child's lifestyle behaviors, uh, so for example, daily screen time, portion size, and then their answers were contrasted um, on, on the iPad uh, against descriptive data or normative data from the Canadian population, for example, the Canadian Health Measure Survey, or injunctive data. Uh, for example, using national guidelines such as Canada Food Guide. So, for example, if you ask, on a typical day, how many minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity does your child get? And mom selects 15, 16 to 30 minutes per day. And then mom's response could be contrasted against descriptive data. You said your child typically gets uh, this many minutes per day. Did you know that Canadian children of the same age and sex as your child typically get 47 minutes of MVPA per day? Or her response could be contrasted against injunctive data using Canadian guidelines. Um, did you know that Canadian guidelines recommend that children should get 60 minutes of uh, MVPA per day? So this is uh, it's, uh, based on um, Bandura's uh, social cognitive theory in trying to create a cognitive discrepancy um, because previous studies established that cognitive dissonance um, can have a strong influence on intentions to change behaviors. You have to be careful to create an optimal discrepancy because discrepancy that's, uh, that's um, 
two, two uh, small may not influence um, intention, but the one that's perceived to be unattainable uh, will also dampen the motivation to change. Um, we just had a PhD student completed her her P, defended her PhD using uh, this uh, this work, and the results are being published. Um, I won't talk about what we found, um, but I want to refer you to or show you um, an article that was published in the New Yorker in 2004 that discussed the same phenomenon um, of weightness perception, but with respect to autism spectrum disorder and the belief that autism is caused by vaccinations, the MMR vaccine um, in infancy, uh, despite the literature, despite the fact that the literature has refuted uh, this relationship. And uh, the, the font may be too small, but what did they find? Um, they found a whole lot of nothing. The result was dramatic, a whole lot of nothing. None of the interventions worked. The first leaflet focused on a lack of evidence connecting vaccines and autism seemed to reduce misperception about the link, but it did nothing to affect intentions to vaccinate. It even decreased intent among people who held the most negative attitudes towards vaccine, a phenomenon known as the backfire effect. Um, so the researchers say that this is this is quite quite depressing. Um, another challenge when we work in weight misperception and trying to correct misperception is the iatrogenic consequences, such as increased waste preoccupation, stigma, body dissatisfaction, poor self-efficacy, self-esteem, and the potential to provoke eating disorders. Um, and we have recently shown uh, in, in children that accurate weight perceptions uh, are indeed a risk factor for poor psychosocial health. Um, and girls were particularly vulnerable to the influence of having accurate perceptions of, of access weight on, on psychosocial uh, health. I don't believe there are any longitudinal studies on this topic yet. Um, I want to change gears here a little bit, uh, and uh, I was told that there's a fair number of students uh, who, are, who are participating uh, in this webinar, and I just want to talk about how do we study change. So when we, when we uh, look uh, in this field of Crohn's disease prevention, we're interested obviously in the change in risk, and we're, changing, uh, we're interested in change in risk factors. Uh, so the, Exposures are changing, outcomes are changing. How do we study this? How do we make sense of this? How do we detect a signal? How do we arrange the data? So there are obviously many, many different ways and depending on what type of data you have. Um, here I uh, show a, a study by a, a colleague, uh, Mathieu Belanger, who showed a sustained participation in physical activity over five years. Now this study was following uh, youth for uh, six years and they were evaluated. Uh, physical activity was assessed every three months. So you're able to construct um, these trajectories uh, of sustained participation in um, a physical activity and then break it down whether it's light, uh, moderate, uh, or vigorous. Uh, another way to study uh, the same data, uh, you see here 20 ways uh, from the same study, is to use uh, a latent approach, a latent growth curve modeling. Uh, growth here does not necessarily mean um, that it's positive, growth could be negative. Um, uh, for example, like trajectories of depressive, depressive symptoms across the life course. Um, but here we uh, are, rather than specifying whether it's light, moderate, moderate or vigorous, we are letting the computer generate uh, or the software uh, generate these trajectories uh, for us. And then as a next step, um, here's another example using trajectories of uh, leisure physical activity uh, in, in adults um, from who participated in the Canada Fitness Survey. Um, again, finding trajectories of people. 
And then what do we do? How do we make, make sense of these latent trajectories because we don't really know what they are? Um, then as a next step, we found these trajectories, we found people, separated people into uh, whether they're active, increase, decrease, or inactive, uh, as for example in, in this paper. Um, and then as a next step, we would use uh, regression analysis to try to figure out who are the people that belong in, um, in these classes. So in this example, we see that um, women, uh, older participants, and those with lower household income, lower educational attainment, were significantly less likely to follow active uh, versus inactive uh, trajectories of um, uh, lifestyle, um, of, of physical activity, sorry. This essentially shows uh, similar uh, trajectories for screen time, and I think in the interest of time, um, this shows trajectories for, smoke, for, for smoking, again, using latent approach, and then trying to relate um, these to um, sociodemographic parameters that you have in the data, trying to figure out who uh, these people are. But this approach, uh, you know, it's modeling exposure, but it doesn't really tell us much about the outcome. Um, with, we're trying to identify who these people are in these groups, but we don't know what their risk for chronic disease is. How do we study um, change behavior modification um, in, in uh, lifestyle behaviors? I think the literature on smoking cessation is probably the most mo most advanced and um, has been shown that following smoking cessation, uh, the risk for coronary heart disease, heart attack, stroke, uh, risk of death from lung cancer, risk of coronary heart disease, uh, becomes improves and uh, re reaches that of a non-smoker following a certain number of years. Here we we have after one year, after five to fifteen years, after ten years, after fifteen years, um, after twenty years. How do we study this? Uh, so w how did this study do this? Um, you would look at uh, smoking uh, cessation histories using questionnaire data. Uh, this is an example of a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, just a few years ago uh, using um, data from 200,000 women and men, uh, 25 years and older, who were um, interviewed uh, and they obtained their smoking cessation histories. And then the, these, these questionnaire data were related to causes of death that occurred by uh, 2006, uh, I believe. And this shows, uh, this figure shows effect of smoking cessation or quitting smoking uh, on survival to 80 years of age according to the age at which time you quit uh, smoking and shows that the, the horizontal bars here show the number of years that you would gain. Um, and we see that between four and 10 years um, are, can be gained. Life expectancy could be increased from four to 10 years among smokers who quit depending on their age at the time of smoking cessation. This is another way of looking at the same data. It comes from the same study. Uh, shows the risk of death among participants who continue to smoke versus those who quit smoking um, according to the age at the time of cessation. So this is 
using mortality using questionnaire data and linking it with mortality you could do the same thing for incidents such as cancer incidents for example using registry registry uh, data now when we talk about other risk factors such as uh, healthy eating and physical activity things become more difficult uh, to study why because Obviously, it takes more time and effort to gather the data on, on um, dietary exposures, and it's also more difficult to detect an effect. This is a study that is just coming out in Public Health Nutrition uh, that we published um, with the postdoctoral fellow leading this work uh, in children using dietary quality index that characterized uh, diet into dietary adequacy, variety, moderation, and overall balance, and then we linked it to two-year prospective changes, so just change between time one and time two, so delta, uh, simple, simple uh, change between time one and time two. We are just undertaking the work to, uh, to study change in dietary exposures, so modification of diet, and um, I can tell you that it's not, not so easy. Um, this study from um, a randomized control trial, again, looking at not primary prevention, but secondary prevention, um, looking at influence of adherence to behavioral recommendations, diet, exercise, and smoking modification on the risk of cardiovascular events, so recurrent cardiovascular events, cardiac infarction, stroke, um, cardiovascular death, and all-cause mortality that was um, documented at one, two, and six months, so the, the horizontal bar at the bottom, um, using 18,000 participants from 41 countries. What's interesting, before we even look at the effect sizes, uh, looking at the number of patients. So these are, uh, as I said, this is secondary prevention. So these are people who already had an event, a cardiovascular event. Um, and looking at adherence, um, we see that about one third of smoking persisted uh, in smoking. So as you move down on the number of patients, um, at the top you see never smoker, diet, or exercise. So this is our role model. And then as we move forward, we see that a, um, a third persisted in smoking. Similar, about 30% did not adhere to diet or exercise recommendations. Um, about and only 30% reported adherence to both diet and, and exercise. Uh, what, looking at the effect sizes, we see that patients who reported persistent smoking and non-adherence to diet and exercise had a 3.8-fold increased risk of recurrent cardiovascular events, MI, stroke, or death, compared to never smokers who modified their diet and who followed an exercise regimen. Um, but again, this type of study would not tell us about primary prevention. If uh, clinicians uh, that um, I work with often say, well, I'd love to say to a patient, if you were to change your, increase your fruit and vegetable intake, uh, your risk of cancer would increase by, uh, would decrease rather by this much, and what, how can we, um, uh, study changes in diet and changes in risk. I've recently reviewed um, literature on um, diet, physical activity, and cancer prevention, and um, this is this comes this graph comes from um, the uh, American Institute for Cancer Research and World Cancer Research Fund. They have what's called a continuous update project (CUP) that continuously monitors the evidence on uh, diet, physical activity, and cancer risk. And it's interesting looking at this evidence. 
For the most part, these were, this evidence comes from case control studies. As we know, case control studies are prone to recall bias, uh, selection bias, but the evidence from the methodologically stronger cohort studies is still very limited and less consistent. For example, with regard to uh, red meat and processed meat consumption, the WHO International Agency for Research in Cancer, IARC, recently uh, published a monograph that they evaluated over 800 studies uh, worldwide on meat consumption and cancer risk. And interestingly, there were about 14 study, cohort studies on, this, on the topic of red meat consumption and 18 cohort studies on the topic of processed meat consumption. How many studies were in Canada? One. Uh, and this was not a primary prevention cohort. This was a secondary prevention uh, cohort of breast cancer screening, um, uh, based on based cancer screening cohort. Um, for the fruit and vegetable intake, for example, um, the initial evidence that was coming from case control studies showed substantial risk, odds ratio of two uh, for diet-related cancers. But as evidence from cohort studies started, started to come out, it was much more, um, uh, much low, showed much lower um, evidence of risk, and this continuous update project downgraded the evidence in relation to fruit and vegetable consumption and cancer risk. Um, now it's uh, you see the convincing evidence, the red. Um, uh, um, squares uh, only for the upper GI uh, cancers. I'll just talk for a few minutes. I'm uh, seeing that I'm a little bit over time. Um, but another way of approaching uh, change, studying this, the, 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 the topic of change in diet is looking at diet of people who have immigrated from one country to another. And substantial body of evidence on the link between diet and cancer risk comes from what's called migrant uh, studies. And it shows that the adoption of Western type diet and lifestyle in countries with high incidence, uh, high prevalence of unhealthy behaviors uh, can substantially increase cancer risk for colorectal um, and uh, hormone-related cancer, such as breast and uh, prostate cancer. Uh, on the other hand, it can also lower uh, risk for uh, in Asian populations for stomach cancer because uh, in Asia, diets are high in salt and nitrate-containing food. Um, again, looking at um, differences between migrant populations and uh, risk of um, mortality, cardiovascular mortality, cancer mortality shows that their health advantage, health, immigrants are healthier on arrival uh, to the host country, but this uh, health advantage wanes um, with time, about 10 years uh, of residence in the host country. And it's been demonstrated for all cause cancer and cardiovascular mortality. Um, there is evidence, John Kerner recently published a paper um, linking uh, immigrant status with cancer, uh, cancer incidence and uh, self-reported chronic conditions. But again, this, this type of evidence leads us to uh, speculate that it's related to uh, lifestyle behaviors, but there's very little evidence to date to show that uh, to show this difference. Um, we have published uh, a couple of papers, one on obesity, uh, showing um, in in children showing differences between Canadian-born first generation and second generation immigrants, and saying that that. Uh, demonstrating that if you look at um, 
rate of increase in body mass index between first generation, second generation, and native born, that this health advantage that immigrants possess really wanes within uh, the first generation. It's really lost within the first generation. We've also demonstrated this for smoking. Um, I have not been involved in, in studies that um, pertain to uh, physical activity. And maybe the last slide, and I will I'll stop. Um, I think a lot of the studies uh, on uh, obesogenic environment that I was showing you earlier um, uh, on immigrant uh, on immigrants adopting the Western style um, lifestyle behaviors really point us to the importance of environment. And I think when we talk about lifestyle behavioral modifications, it's important to recognize and evidence is really beginning to accumulate to a characterize these environmental, uh, these characteristics of the immediate environment in which people live and work uh, and demonstrate the link with um, overweight and obesity and chronic disease risk. I will stop um, there. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Katrina. That was very interesting uh, to see your work on how you've looked at uh, preventing chronic disease from a various uh, large data sets. And uh, um, I see a nice uh, uh, compliment to you already from Mary Noel and to all participants in the chat box. So uh, I would like to invite all participants to, um, if you have any questions or comments, to uh, type your questions in the chat box. Um, and while I'm doing that, maybe I can um, ask Katrina uh, a question from your presentation that um, kind of piqued my interest is where you uh, described the differences in weight perception between males and females and why, you know, I'm sure there's an explanation for it, but how do you um, explain that difference and how does it impact, uh, you know, health and well-being in the long term for men and women in general? Mm -hmm. Um, thank you for um, this question. Yes, we, we do see consistently in both uh, children and in adults uh, that women are better at recognizing um, their overweight. Um, again, I think here an interesting um, link, well, it's been shown that women are hypothesized and shown that women are more susceptible to the societal pressures to be thin uh, and uh, has been shown in, in the psych mental health literature that they're more affected by this pressure to be thin and uh, their, their psychosocial health suffers. Uh, as a result, so and then I guess if if women are more, um, you know, on top of their well-being or weight, in this case, it might have a positive impact on their long-term uh, health. In in your opinion, because they're more aware and maybe more um, keen to make changes to their uh, lifestyles. Absolutely. So this is a double-edged sword, right? So on the one hand, you want people to be aware because it motivates them to um, engage in healthy lifestyle behaviors. But on the other hand, uh, we are raising the awareness uh, uh, and the importance of psychosocial, the effect on psychosocial health and that uh, these the people may need help to maintain uh, high self-esteem and self-efficacy to engage in these behaviors. Yeah, okay, interesting. Um, I have a question here um, uh, from the floor from uh, Dr. Lauren Griffith. Um, she asks, so you present data uh, uh, as specific risk factors and outcomes, but of course, and I think you might have alluded to that, that risk factors cluster together like obesity and sedentary behavior. Uh, can you also uh, examine these clusters of risk factors and outcomes together? This is a fantastic question. Thank you so much for asking. Uh, in fact, this is what I was just writing about. The literature is emerging as we are um, understanding that behaviors cluster, or what uh, some people in the literature have called core curve, uh, 
So someone who um, consumes an unhealthy diet is also um, more likely to uh, not be physically active, uh, have uh, and etc. And uh, I, I'm not aware of studies in adults, but there are three studies in uh, children. Uh, one by Scott Leatherdale, uh, Gilles Paradis, um, a couple published a couple of papers on what's called co-occurrence of chronic disease risk factors and relating these. Uh, in a similar fashion, I think the literature that I recently reviewed on dietary factors and cancer risk, uh, the one that from the continuous update project, it was very interesting to me that this literature looks at isolating the effect of uh, fruit and vegetable intake, isolating the effect of, of meat intake, but we forget that these behaviors cluster and co-occur. Okay, great. Um, I have another uh, indirect question that came to uh, me. Um, uh, I know that you mentioned when you were doing an overview of all the studies that there was very few studies in Canada, but of course now uh, with the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, we have large volumes of data and lifestyle behaviors uh, in a longitudinal way. Um, what do you think, um, you know, how could the CLSA data be used for future studies? And I know this is not specifically your um, your area of research, but, um, you know, what do you think would be kind of the, the key gap in knowledge out there that the CLSA data could be used for if you can extrapolate from your expertise yeah. in the younger population? Mm -hmm. I, I think that I, I try to structure the talk and highlight the key points, and I'll certainly make the slides available after the, the, the presentation. Um, I think uh, CLSA serves as a great resource uh, as you are accumulating data. I know that you have baseline information on a lot of lifestyle behaviors already collected. I think you can start there. Uh, I think you are currently uh, maybe collecting a second wave of, of lifestyle behaviors. Uh, but also I understand that a huge number of participants, uh, close to 90%, have consented to having their data linked to um, cancer registries or mortality databases. And I think uh, looking at um, healthy, healthy uh, trajectories, uh, sorry, uh, trajectories of healthy uh, lifestyle behaviors as people age uh, it would be a fantastic um, contribution to, to the literature. How do people end up um, you know, for example, with physical activity, we know that physical activity declines with age. Um, looking at people who have not, looking at trajectories of the people uh, of their behaviors, looking at their uh, other their other behaviors, uh, how can we prevent this from happening? Okay. Well, great. Thank you very much, uh, Katrina. That was a nice plug for the CLSA. And uh, I hope that many of you who are attending our webinar and are maybe students, uh, maybe to go check out our website and see how you can apply to use CLSA data. Um, since we're almost close to one o'clock, I want to thank you very much, Katrina, for an excellent presentation. Uh, that was a really uh, a nice layout of what you can do uh, with uh, large databases and looking at how you can prevent chronic diseases, which we all know is is a is a challenge for the aging population. So thank you very much. Um, I also want to uh, attend, um, make the attendees aware that we have two more uh, webinars um, coming up. Um, there is one on November 22nd by um, Dr. Verena Manning of the University of Manitoba, and she is actually going to um, present. Oh, here we are. She's going to present uh, data from the CLSA and looking at uh, uh, definitions of social isolation. And the second uh, webinar that will be in December will also be looking at data from the CLSA. And this uh, presentation will uh, be about pet ownership and social participation and life satisfaction in all our uh, adults in Canada. So I hope um, if this is of interest uh, to our attendees, uh, you will attend for these webinars as well. Again, as uh, we have indicated, the uh, webinar will be on our website um, 
uh, in, the, in a couple of weeks and you will be notified if you had registered for this uh, webinar to go and you can look at the slides or listen back to the presentation. So with this, um, thank you very much for participating today and I will hope to see you in the future. Thank you very much.